Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us on this live special edition event, Self-Care is Key. Open the door to ask an expert panel for community resources. My name is Jennifer Potterbuff, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. I'm one of the chaplains here at Tampa General, and we are delighted to welcome our experts. Yesterday, Monday, October 10th, was World Mental Health Day, and in honor of that, we're excited to have this team of experts from an array of organizations who provide services focusing on self-care for community members in need. All of us are impacted in our daily lives by all types of stress. And as a community, our self-care often slips to the bottom of our to-do list. Taking care of ourselves isn't a luxury, but it's a necessity for our emotional and mental well-being. Our panelists are gonna provide an overview of their organization and the services that they provide. Today, we're host, hosting Dr. Tanuja Sharma, who practices in family and, and integrative medicine, and is also the medical director here at TGH for our integrative medicine and arts program. We also have Luis Rivas, VP of Clinical Services for Central Florida Behavioral Health Network. We have Laurel Porter, who is the training coordinator at the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay. And we have Carrie Zeiss, who's the president and CEO of Tampa Bay Thrives. Welcome and thank you all so much for being with us. So these four are some of the most experienced professionals in their field, and we are so glad to have them with us today. If you have any questions during the live session, we hope that you'll place those comments uh, in, the, in the comment section of this live. We do ask that you try to keep your questions general. Uh, we can't give specific medical advice, and we will do our best to get to all of your questions. We've also had a number of uh, pre-submitted questions today, so we know that this is a hot topic. And although we're talking with medical and community experts here today, we just want to offer the reminder that you should always be consulting with your primary care provider for individual medical advice. So let's begin with our first panelist, Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma, will you tell us a little bit about the services that you and your team offer here at Tampa General? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm the medical director of the Integrative Medicine and Arts Program at TGH. And what are program does, we offer a non-pharmacological approach to pain, anxiety, and the stressors related to just being in the hospital. So um, anyone can put in the consult and we get consulted on several different types of patients from labor and delivery, NICU, oncology, transplant, and their medical team will put a place a consult in and um, we see the patient and provide any natural non-pharmacological approach to their conditions. So some of our offerings include music therapy. We have licensed musicians that with the rhythm of their voice and the melody of their music, we can help manipulate heart rate and either uplift the person if, they, if that's what they need in the moment, or we can um, bring down their respiratory or heart rate if that's what they need in the moment. Um, we provide several different mindfulness techniques like breathing exercises, meditation, guided imagery, and we do this right at the bedside for our patients. And we hope that they learn different tools along, um, along the hospitalization with us. And these are things that they can use on their own at night when we're not there or as they get discharged and even after. Um, we have a licensed touch therapist that does therapeutic massage. We have aroma. And so we really offer support for a patient's um, in the hospital setting in that acute state and regardless of the reason for them being there most people people would prefer not to be in the hospital than um, be in the hospital and so there's a level of stress and anxiety that is um, that just has resulted of the stressors are being um, hospitalized and so we help with that um, transition as they get discharged we help to support them and one of my main goals and projects right now is to help alleviate specific pain and anxiety. And so we're doing some research to collect um, pain and anxiety scores on patients and if that results in them using less benzos and less opioids. And so we're seeing that with these tools, patients are using their medications maybe a little bit later or less of a dose. And so anything that we can do to really balance the mind and the body to help bring them in a state of home homeostasis and help them bring them just in a state that they can improve and recover and heal and take in the treatment a little better is um, kind of our philosophy and our goal of our program. And so we're a small group, but we really um, do fulfilling work and we help um, patients at the bedside. So 
I'm very passionate about integrative medicine and mental health is such an important topic. So happy to answer questions and be here today. Thanks so much, Dr. Sharma. Our next speaker is Luis Rivas. Uh, Luis, will you share um, a little bit about yourself and what it is that Central Florida Behavioral Health Network offers to the community? Certainly. Thank you for the opportunity, first of all, for being part of this group and uh, having the opportunity to see you guys. Um, so I work for Central Florida Behavioral Health Network. Um, we are a not-for-profit organization that was uh, implemented in 1997. So our job is honestly to build a system of care for our community. So that's going to be over 60 providers that are currently contracted. Um, the funds that we um, manage are the ones that come from the Department of Children and Family. Uh, it is for the underinsured or uninsured uh, population. So with that being said, um, we try to make sure that we're looking for the next opportunity of braiding funding with our community partners. Um, right now, we just had 126 million that came to our state which we're very excited about because it's recurring funds. Um, for years, we continue to talk about how mental health is so important. And now we've had the opportunity to be able to uh, uh, tie these uh, funds to it. Um, some of the projects that we have are acute care services, which is going to be your crisis stabilization units, your detox centers, um, but also residential programs. So it has a form of step down. Uh, we also have non-acute care services, which are your outpatient services, our preventative uh, services, where there's a lot of emphasis on the multidisciplinary team um, process, which is going to be all aspects of an individual. Uh, one of the things that we try to do is, is have that holistic approach where it's not just one part of the individual because you have a mental illness that's not the only thing you assert, you wanna have that integrated approach. Um, with the multidisciplinary teams, we're able to bring the services to the individual as opposed to only having one option of coming to uh, on site. Um, we also have a native project that we started with school districts that um, we're working with children in the school districts. We have truly embedded ourselves with the district to be able to show um, our uh, opportunities to fill in those gaps. You know, there's that connectivity to services. We're always talking about access to care. Well, now that we're able to bring the services on site to schools in Hillsborough alone, we have 104 uh, schools that we have designated therapists in and we're working hand in hand with our district. Um, in short, that's what we do. I mean, there's much, much more. Um, I think our contract right now this year, uh, we're up to 240, uh, no, excuse me, $264 million that we're managing and having that oversight for our system of care. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Laurel Porter, who is coming to us from the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay. And Laurel, if you if you will introduce yourself and um, share some about what uh, the Crisis Center offers to the community. Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for having me. I'm very excited to be on this panel. Um, so as, as uh, was said, my name is Laurel Porter. I'm the training coordinator at the Crisis Center, which means I work to develop trainings related to mental health, resiliency, self-care, burnout, and many others. It seems like the list goes on and on. Um, but we develop those trainings uh, with our in-house subject matter experts or um, with, with help from our community partners to create uh, these trainings that are really beneficial and effective for um, organizations in the community. And soon we hope to offer um, workshops for everyday members of the public to come in and, and benefit from. So our, our main mission at the Crisis Center is really to ensure that no one in our community faces crisis alone. And when we say the word crisis, we mean really anything that can, can be a crisis. Um, I've, I've had people ask me during um, trainings or presentations such as, the, as this one, well, what exactly, what kind of crisis? Well, what about this crisis? And my answer is all. Um, and we... To, to really meet that mission, we have three main service areas. Uh, the first being our trans care ambulance system. Um, and then we have our Corbett Trauma Center and our Gateway Call Center. So for trans care, um, that is our ambulance services that an answer 911 calls and go out on those emergency response calls. Um, they also do um, pickups for Baker and Marchman Acts for transports. 
Um, and they have a community paramedicine program that's been going on for, for a few years now that works to help put people's health in their own hands. Um, and they operate things such as vaccination clinics. So the trans care side of things really helps uh, people who are in some kind of physical crisis, uh, some kind of health crisis at the moment. But we also have services related to people's mental well-being and other various crises that may go on in their lives. So um, for, for those individuals who have experienced um, sexual assault, um, our Corbett Trauma Center is there to help. Um, at Corbett, we have different service areas within that department, including sexual assault services. Um, so in Hillsborough County, if, if you are raped or sexually assaulted, you no longer need to go to a hospital emergency room for a forensic exam. Instead, you would come to our office, which is on Bears, uh, near Bears in 275, um, where you're met with a nurse and an advocate who will guide you through the process of the exam, um, work to get you set up with therapies afterwards, help you through the legal system, really any kind of advocacy work that could be needed. And then we have our trauma counseling center within Corbett who work with individuals who have suffered um, from trauma. Uh, we work with our, our funding and with um, different kinds of uh, grants to ensure that anyone who qualifies for our therapy um, gets it so that no one goes without. And we also, if they don't qualify, help link them to services and supports within the community that they can turn to. And then also within Corbett, we have our care coordinators who focus kind of on suicide prevention and advocacy as it relates to, um, to trauma counseling and our other clients that we serve. Um, and then finally, we have our gateway. Um, we have our gateway call center. Um, the main thing that we're known for at the crisis center, at least I feel like, is the two one one number. So when you hear call two one one, that leads right to to our our building, and our fabulous, well trained staff will um, talk to you one on one on the phone and help connect you with resources in the community. Um, they also answer um, a plethora of different phone lines, including the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, um, our Florida Veterans Support Line, and our First Responder Support Line, which are two incredibly important peer support lines, um, as well as the statewide drug and alcohol hotline. So those three service areas help us to meet the needs of our community and help to ensure that no one faces a crisis alone. Um, and um, the final piece of that is offering the training, as I mentioned before. So that's really why I'm here. And um, that's a little bit about the Crisis Center. So thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, Carrie Zeiss from Tampa Bay Thrives. We'd love to hear a little bit about you and your organization. Sure. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to join this esteemed panel. Um, so Tampa Bay Thrives is a fairly new organization. We were founded three years ago by community leaders, including um, the leaders of all the organizations of, this, of the expert panel here, um, who came together caring deeply about mental health. There's a lot of great programs in our community, but surveys that were administered continue to show that mental health was a persistent concern. Um, access to providers, how people were managing their mental health, and that was not getting better despite some significant um, investment um, across the, the, the spectrum of services. And so these leaders decided that to help increase outcomes and to make sure that people were getting access to care faster, were able to navigate the system um, a little bit easier and to decrease the stigma associated with mental health, that they would start a 501c3 nonprofit, which is us. So we work with all of you um, in our community to help identify gaps and develop solutions so that people can heal faster. Um, we really believe as a coalition that, you know, taking care of your mental health should be as easy as and, and, and as normalized as taking care of your physical health. And so I love hearing about just everything that is happening with, with our partners here in this call. Um, I also wanna share that, so Tampa Bay Thrives is a Mental Health America affiliate. Um, that's a national um, organization. Um, as such, we've got access to free screenings. If you're not sure, um, if you're depressed or anxious, um, you can take a free screening. It's linked on our website. Um, we also have worksheets and information on topics like prioritizing self-care, overcoming repetitive thoughts, managing frustration and anger, seven tips for talking to a loved one about their mental health and how to deal with change. These are all these things that can 
happen to us in the course of our life, which can destabilize us. And when they mount and you don't deal um, with the escalating impacts of change, family members, you know, the, what we've been through in the last three years, it, it can build. And, and, and part of the theme of this taking care of yourself is making time to check in to make sure that you are managing your mental health actively. Um, another service that we have is our Let's Talk platform, which we launched in 2021. Um, it's a combination of resources and I'll should have walk you through what's available. There is a phone line that is, uh, it's free and it's staffed by counselors who can help you get to therapists or counselors um, that are in the, that are in kind of the broader system that take insurance, for instance, if you're trying to figure out, well, what kind of person do I need to talk to? Um, do I need a psychiatrist? Can I talk to a psychologist or is a counselor okay? Um, it's a great entry point for having those conversations confidentially. If you're concerned about a loved one, um, or you're not sure if you're struggling with anxiety or depression, sort of low level concerns, not crisis level concerns, it's a great place to call. Um, it also is the connection point by which we have expanded an access program of which TGH is a, is a partner. So thank you very much for that. And that, those options are, you know, say you're, you're really feeling like you need to talk to someone kind of quickly. It's getting to short-term appointments at potentially an urgent care walk-in center or at a, a, a local drugstore. It also is linked to a program that we run with the crisis center, which we call our bridge counseling. Say you have an appointment and it's four weeks in the future and you're just not sure that you can wait. If you have that appointment, you can call and you can get free four therapy sessions plus a connection to psychiatry if you need medication support, not controlled substances, but other, uh, other medication support. Um, that is something that Tampa Bay Thrives uh, provides free of charge for individuals who qualify because we want to make sure that you don't get worse and don't end up in an emergency room if you have a condition that we can manage outside of that. Um, another component that we have, if you're more interested in self-guided resources, is our website is rich with, um, we have you know free resources. Every month we have a theme. We do purpose-built, uh, very short breathing exercises. Every month we have two of them for various things like relaxation or re-energizing or dealing with frustration, things that you can take in small snippets to just engage in and reset so that you can go on with your day. Um, yeah, so that's those are all the things that we have available. Fantastic. Will you tell us what the, what the website address is, Carrie? Absolutely. So the website is letstalktampabay.org. The, and is the phone number that you were talking about listed there as well? Yep, it's 844 -OK, -OK Y-O-U-O-K-A-Y. Great. I'm, I'm personally glad to know that. I spend a lot of time with um, staff at the hospital helping connect them to resources. So I'm thrilled to know that those um, exist in the community. And can I just say one other thing? Yeah. Um, we do have, if you're a manager or you've, you know, you, you're, you're someone who is, is sort of more from an organizational perspective and you're managing people and you're trying to find out about trends in mental health in the workplace or how you can support your team, Tampa Bay Thrives has a corresponding, so at tampabaythrives.org, corresponding email letter, which also always has a breathing technique, one that's more meant for the workplace. Um, we always have free resources every month and we, we list to, to other programs, uh, one of which is the Mental Health America Bell Seal program, which um, provides certification for workplaces that are really best in practice. So they're doing all of those things that employers, we love to see employers doing to support employees because we spend so many hours in, at work that we, uh, the, the more that you feel your employer cares about your mental health and the more normalized it is to talk about it. We, you know, we see the statistics, it's, it's who's employee engagement. I mean, you know, everything, loyalty, retention. So that's Tampa Bay Thrives. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So thank you again um, to all four of you. We're um, gonna turn to some questions. Uh, as a reminder, you are more than welcome to drop questions into the comment sections, um, but we do have some pre-submitted questions. So we'll start there today. Um, so. Here's our first one. As a caregiver um, for a loved one who has some diagnosed mental health concerns, how do I take care of my own mental health? How do I care for myself in the midst of being a caregiver? I think that 
um, dovetails nicely with what you were saying, Carrie, about um, all the concerns that have built on us over the last two years. Many of us find ourselves in caregiver roles. And so how do we care for ourselves, um, especially if the person we're caring for has their own uh, complicated histories? I'll jump in on this one. This is Luis. Um, yeah, I'd be remiss if we don't make sure that we connect uh, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. I mean, they have a plethora of just resources on their um, website, and it's a link to our website as well. But the goal is that the, the safe platform that's persons that are living or have gone through it. So it's a peer um, emphasis on it. So it's not, you know, only professionals where I think that it speaks volumes when somebody's able to empathize at that level and be able to state what has truly worked for them. Um, so yeah, the, the family to family uh, peer supports, those, those are all really helpful in those situations. Absolutely. Um, another question that we have is, what is the best self-care routine for someone living with a chronic illness who maybe doesn't have a lot of energy? What are some things that we can do um, that don't require a lot of um, a lot of energy to be spent? Um, I can answer this one, and I think all of us, all of the panelists, have mentioned um, breath work a few times or breathing exercises. Um, I love breathing exercises and deep breathing because one, it's free. What, two, you can do this anywhere. No one, no one really knows that you're doing it, and when you're doing it. And they're quite effective if you do them properly. And the idea is when you slow your breathing down and you exhale longer than you inhale, you are stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. And that is responsible for relaxation and rest. And so if you find yourself in a acute situation where you're getting anxious or just just take a moment and um, do a quick deep breathing exercises. There's several, you know, that are out there. Um, and I can mention a couple and you guys can look them up. But um, one of my personal favorites is a four, seven, eight. And so you breathe in for four, you hold your breath for seven and you exhale for eight. And when you exhale, you really want to keep your mouth open and make a whooshing noise like um, that's just one that I, I really use and find a powerful. There's other ones that you can breathe in for one second and, you know, repeat in your mind a positive mantra or affirmation. And so I like this one in the hospital setting because it's easy and people can follow. So when you take a deep breath in, think to yourself, I am. And when you exhale, think to yourself at peace. So you inhale, I am and exhale piece. And the idea is that you slow your breathing and you, it's very quick. It's very effective. It's something that's been given to us and underutilized. And so um, many breath exercises throughout your day is important. And I'd like to add that we utilize, we can utilize these in an acute stressful situation, but if you do them on a regular basis, even when you're feeling calm or relaxed, um, that helps to set these pathways in your brain so that when you do utilize them in that situation, you can get to that state of calmness a little easier and quicker. So I recommend doing it every day. I personally do it on my way to work and my way home from work because that's time that I'm in the car for at least 30 minutes and I can get in a few sessions of good deep breathing. And sometimes, you know, being on the road is anxiety triggering because of Tampa drivers and traffic, but sometimes I'm calm. So it's just a way that I know that I'll get in some deep breathing twice a day and then, you know, prioritize some type of um, time in your day where you can um, add in some type of mindfulness. And there's several different mindfulness techniques and strategies out there, and we are all built differently. And so sitting down and meditating might not work for everyone, but your breath is always with you and that's something that we all carry. So that's something that is easy, um, effective, and um, yeah, something that you can easily do in your day. So I think that's a, a good one for anyone listening to take home. I'd also like to jump in. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma. That was some great, some great tips, especially the breathing. I, I want to try a few of those myself. Um, but um, when thinking about chronic illness, 
for a person who is experiencing chronic illness, they might have a, a day where their capacity, so I like to think of self-care in terms of capacity. So what's my capacity at for caring for myself? Am I at a, a full level where I have a surplus of energy to devote to my self-care or is my level kind of dwindling and I need to refill it so I'm I'm better off to even practice my own self-care. So for individuals who are experiencing chronic illness and might have those ups and downs in their days, my suggestion would be to find self-care tasks um, that can uh, go across a spectrum of your capacity. So on days that you have full capacity and you feel energized, um, then maybe you can devote more time to maybe getting outside, getting some fresh air. Whereas on the days when your capacity is lowered, giving yourself grace because that's just how chronic illness goes and finding self-care tasks that while it would be great to get outside and take a walk and get some sunshine, maybe for today while our capacity is lowered, we just walk around our living room for a little bit. And taking um, taking whatever that big self-care task might be, that's a that's could be a goal for us if we're trying to create a self-care regimen and breaking it down to, to smaller pieces that we can do when our capacity is lowered. Because um, it happens to all of us, especially those who um, have chronic illnesses. Um, that's just a recommendation on, on my end. Could I say one additional thing? Laurel, I love that. That is so like meeting yourself where you are and, and, and giving yourself grace. It's such a powerful combination. And, and Dr. Sharma, what you were saying about breath work, just it, there, there was one other practice that I learned. I, I read about it from a Harvard researcher that when combined with breath work is very powerful for me. And I'm thinking about the first question, the individual who asked, if you're taking care of someone who's ill, what do you do? For yourself. Well, first of all, make time for yourself. It's important. Um, and, and this fact that I learned is that the physical feelings of being triggered when you're in a moment of crisis um, actually move through you within 90 seconds if you can stay in your body. And so if you can give yourself 90 seconds to breathe while you're experiencing stress, if you're having a moment where you're concerned or overwhelmed while taking care of someone, try to breathe into it and recognize that it'll pass if you don't feel it, if you don't feed it, um, and then let it de-escalate so you can back, be back into the moment of being able to take care of yourself and the person that you're caring for, um, just to get out of that moment of being triggered. That fight or flight moment um, is not good for us. And when we breathe, you, you think of it, when you're running fast, you breathe shallowly. When, when you are in a relaxed state, you breathe deeply, right? You're telling your body that you're okay. So just wanted to add that one thing. Yeah, I agree. This is a great addition. And it's just what I'm saying is that if, if you can do it as a common practice where when it, when you go to use it, when you're in that level of heightened state, then it's much easier to get back to it. But I mean, I, you know, we all have heard the statement, uh, you can't fill from an empty cup. So that's why it's so important to kind of make sure that you take that time to, you know, fill yourself first. You know, uh, I actually got into meditation by a, a challenge, uh, read a book and it was did a 30 day challenge that turned into a year. And now it's a, not a common practice for me in the morning. Um, so much that my wife and I do it uh, and it's like we hold each other accountable. So having that accountability partner is sometimes what uh, is important too, whether it be a church person or, you know, uh, just a person that's also going through it up here, um, but making sure that the communication is um, open uh, that you're able to be very um, just honest with yourself as well as uh, the person that are helping you. A great insight, guys. I just want to um, make a comment on some of the comments that you guys said. We're in regards to mindfulness or meditation. A lot of people think are a little turned off or scared by that word and that terminology and imagine it being, you know, sitting underneath the tree in a meditative pose for 30 minutes. And um, it might be sometimes a lot of people say I'm bad at meditating or I can't or I have monkey brain and my mind wanders. And I just want to, you know, make a comment and say that every moment that you're just sitting for a moment and taking a breath and noticing how you feel is meditating. And so it's completely normal to have thoughts in your mind. That's actually part of meditating too. And so when that happens, you just acknowledge those feelings, acknowledge those thoughts, notice them, and then try to let them go. And it doesn't have to be this, you know, 
concrete 30 minutes. It can be sprinkled throughout your day. And I think that us as a society, especially living in this part of the world and our culture in the United States is very um, focused on work and money making a little bit different from, you know, the other cultures in the other parts of the world. So we have that mentality and we have that mentality to keep going, going, going. And so realistically having ways where you can sprinkle it in. So a few minutes, a few moments, a few seconds throughout the day, um, that I think is very useful. And that I think is very practical and that will look different for each patient, for each person and each individual. And so that's a goal that I would try to get everybody on board. Try to find moments in your day where you can just take a moment, take a breath, look at a nature picture, get outside, look at a tree, just be mindful and soak in all of your senses briefly. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be five minutes. It can be a moment. And surprisingly, and it it really does make significant difference. It really does make you feel good. It really helps to alleviate some stress. And I think the more and more we um, take that in and try to be mindful, um, the more you realize how significant these little moments throughout your day are additive and can help. Um, and we know like in, in medical world, we know a little bit of stress is, is a good thing. It helps us, you know, give us a pep in the steps, it helps us be motivated, full, you know, complete our tasks. But our chronic level of stress repeatedly, months and months, years and years, that's when we see chronic disease. That's when we see burnout. That's when we see all these mental health issues. And so sprinkling in these moments where you can just disconnect, take a moment, doesn't require anything fancy, um, can really be additive and can, um, cumulative and can be really powerful. Absolutely. Um, somebody is asking about, are there free apps um, and free access to care for mental health um, if you don't have medical insurance? So obviously there's, uh, we've been talking about the breathing, there's lots of um, meditative apps that are out there, but are there other opportunities out there for people who don't have insurance? I, I did, We I think we'll be able to share this with all of the, um, people that are on, but we have a um, resource handout that I shared and it has a few mobile apps. Um, I believe some of them are pretty cheap or they're free, but some of them are Insight Timer. That one is a free app. There's Headspace, there's Calm, Mood Notes, Mood Path. So we have a list of some apps that are um, available that are very inexpensive or free. Um, and there's some other resources and some self-care books that are on there. So we'll be able to share that with all of you. Great. Yes, yeah, as far as services, I mean, you can go onto our website and you can see um, on Central Florida Behavioral Health Network's website, cfbhn.org. Um, and, and there's actually several providers throughout, or it depends on what county you're in, but you can look through our resource tab and see what's available in your area, especially right now with um, just, you know, those of us that um, were able to make it through Hurricane Ian and there's just a lot of um, a lot of trauma that just happened, you know, and, and honestly, just the repetition of seeing it on the news, you start feeling it as well. So uh, we put some uh, uh, resources on our website as well for that. I'm glad you brought up the news. Um, I have a comment about about um, your senses. And so I tell, you know, everybody that I meet that's suffering from stress to really take into account what they're surrounding their senses by. So the people that they speak to, um, you know, the people that they choose to be their friends, their, their close knit, their colleagues, um, what you put in your mouth, what you smell, what you see and what you take in and what you read. And so trying to keep your, you know, vibrations high and positive is important. And I think the media, it's good to limit, you know, it's important to be informed and to know what's going on, but the repetitive nature and the constant, um, especially during the last couple of years with the pandemic, I think it's good to limit your media or maybe 
take a moment and read it instead of having this constant burden of all this negativity because we soak that in and it does whether we want it to affect us or not having that repetition and having you know negative media news and all of these things um repeated over and over again does affect us and so anything that we happens to our mind affects our body anything that affects our body you know affects our mind they're inseparable and so to keep your mental health sound. Um, try to limit the media, try to keep your senses and your vibrations as high as much as possible. I personally, you know, sometimes end the day with, if I want to watch TV, something like comedy, my husband gets annoyed because my genre is always like, let's watch a rom-com or something. He's like, can we pick another genre? But for me, that's helpful because I would have nightmares if I watched something negative at the end of the night. And so, um, you know, keep your keep your vibrations, keep your energy, keep the people and things that you do around you um, lighthearted and positive as much as you can. Great. Yeah. And I also want to I think that was a team member question. I want to remind um, TGH team members that there's also the TAVA resource that um, we rolled out earlier this year. And that's free regardless of whether or not you have TGH insurance. It's just part of being in, in a, a team member here. Um, you can find all that information on our portal. The next question is a great one. Any tips on how I can bring these concepts of self-care to my school-aged children? Um, I love this question. I think it works on two levels, right? Like, how do I take care of myself if I have little kids? Um, I have a, a two-and-a-half-year-old and a five-year-old, and I always want my self-care to be apart from them, and sometimes that's not possible, right? So how do we also, so how do we incorporate self-care with our families, and how do we teach little ones uh, to take care of themselves? I think that's an excellent question. Yeah, I'd love to jump in um, on, on working with kids about about this. Um, in a past iteration of my life, I worked as a behavior analyst specifically with children and families um, um, on the autism spectrum. And so working with those family members to um, help them support their children to learn self-help strategies, uh, self-care, mindfulness, breathing techniques, uh, de-escalation, uh, strategies and techniques. Uh, this is something that I'm I'm very passionate about. And my number one um, tip for parents is to model everything you do for your own self care. Model it where they can see it. Um, kind of talk about what you're doing, especially if you're doing something that doesn't necessarily require your vocal input. Talk about it, um, even if your children aren't giving you 100% of their attention. When when are they? Um, but just kind of doing it in their presence, making it commonplace is is so crucial. Um, they'll not only see you doing it um, and, and look to you as a model, as a, a trustworthy adult that they can look to for support and know that you're a person that knows those techniques, um, but they'll also see you do it in the context of your life. Uh, so when you are in traffic and you take a few deep breaths and when you're maybe at the line at the DMV and um, they see you kind of uh, sit down and open up an app and, and work through some kind of mindfulness techniques using your phone. They see those things and they start to learn how to take on some problem solving for themselves. Oh, well, when uh, mommy gets frustrated, I see her do this. And so they're they're seeing you do it. They're seeing the techniques, but also how you use it. So showing them modeling is is very important. I just wanted to also share it for, are you done? I, just, I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, we did a video. One of our breathing techniques was actually for parents and kids. And I did use it when I, I've got a, a, a senior in high school, so she doesn't need this level of uh, guidance to get to a calming down place. But my nieces, when they came to visit, it was very, very helpful because they were little and had a lot of little girl energy. And it's a, it's a meditation where you take your hand and this is great for, for kids and you breathe and you go, up and then down and there's you know so that process of tracing your hand and breathing slowly seats you back in your body because you're touching it gives kids something to watch while it encourages them in that practice of breath we're talking a lot about breath work that's not the only thing you can do but i just want that that video is on our website um it, it, it is great for littles um it, it worked really well when my nieces were in town and it's the modeling thing is just so so critical um, or also thank you for pointing that out. So another question that we've gotten are is, um, 
what tips can you all give on how to deal with mild anxiety? So I assume from that it's anxiety that's not being treated with um, uh, with medicine. So um, all, oh, okay. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think we've all emphasized just the, the breathing techniques, you know, and I know it, it's very simple. And I think um, I often, often make reference to the things that we deal with as building your tool belt, you know, you're not going to go build a house without having your tool belt full of what you need. You can't build a house without nails or et cetera, et cetera. So those different things, and, and I've learned some today. So thank you guys for sharing the ones you have, um, just because that's what you need to have. It's not going to be the same thing every time. It's going to be... A, I, the statement I take away today uh, was definitely meeting yourself where you're at. I uh, couldn't have worded it better. Just very simply, build your tool, tool belt so you can meet yourself where you're at and be able to calm that anxiety down. Um, it may be just that breathing. Um, it may be just that walk. Uh, I know my fur baby is really good about keeping me on check, about making sure I get myself away from the laptop and go outside. Um, you know, you got to have uh, that balance. So it's just recognizing those opportunities uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that we've already mentioned. So, yeah, I think a breathing exercise is the perfect um, tool to use for kind of mild anxiety. Um, there are several different mindfulness modalities out there. I'm just going to list a few. Everyone's different, and so you can kind of experiment with some of these and pick a couple and try, but yoga is my personal favorite. And there's actually research to show that 60 minutes of yoga once a week can treat and cure anxiety, mild to moderate anxiety and depression. And so you, there's several yoga sites that you can look online, YouTube, and you can practice at home and that could be free, or you can join a studio. Um, mindfulness, breathing exercises, we mentioned meditation. Um, I really enjoy acupuncture as well. That's something that um, won't be as cheap. Um, some insurances actually do recognize acupuncture, so you can check with your insurance. But acupuncture, if you're not afraid of teeny tiny needles, um, it's a really great way to get really quick, effective results for kind of calming your nervous system. Um, tai Chi is fantastic. Um, autogenic training. Um, there are several, and then obviously a counselor, therapy, psychiatry. Um, there's some tons of different tools out there. So experiment with a couple and see which works best for you and see what you respond the most to, and then try to pick your favorite and then stick to it because routine and the repetition is really important. I think you both hit on really important parts, right? Like it's it's an experiment sometimes, and we have to have lots of tools in our toolbox. Uh, one tool doesn't fix all of all of the things in our lives, and so we have to have a, a multiplicity of options. and um, And it doesn't have to be something crazy hard. It can be really simple. Um, hammers are pretty simple tools, and they do a lot of things uh, in construction. And so, in the same way, the breathing isn't a terribly difficult tool, and it can make a, a world of difference to us. Um, another question that we got is, um, how do you practice self-care at work? We've talked about breathing, but what are other things we can do at work um, to, to be kind to ourselves? Take so lunch. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Take lunch. I, I say this because uh, this is something that I struggle with often, but... Um, Take lunch. I had a supervisor uh, tell me once, nothing you do is important enough that you cannot eat lunch. And I did at that, at that time, I was like, wait a second, are you saying anything I do is not important? But it was the fact of the matter, that relationship building that you have in, in that designated time to invest into each other and just have, uh, you know, breaking that bread that we often talk about um, is important just to be kind to yourself that the work is always going to be there, you know, and it's, it's so hard to, um, to, you know, let go of it sometimes, but we need to be kind to ourselves and just take, take lunch. <laughs> I love that because many of us don't take lunch um, or they, you know, eating and doing work at the same time, which isn't the same. Um, so at clinic, we started what's called a mindful moment and 
I, we just message each other on t on our little um, teams and whoever can participate or has a moment, we usually try to do it around lunchtime. Literally, it's two minutes and we call it mindful moment. We'll send the group a message. If whoever's available, come to, you know, exam room 10 for mindful moment. And we'll sit there and we have our little lavender um, essential oil and um, we just pass around and everyone gets a drop. And we sit there and we take a couple minutes to breathe a, a guided, guided breathing exercise, literally two minutes. And it just, it's nice because it's a sense of like a little bit of community and it uplifts the office morale and it gives us two minutes away from our screen. And it's never, um, you know, the best moment. We're always busy doing something, but it's nice um, a way to just kind of break away and we kind of collect together. And so you can find a little mindful moment during your work day and just keep a chime or alarm on your phone to remind you of it. And um, it'll just a way to kind of break away. And it's nice to get away from your desk, especially if you're working from home. So when you take your break or your moment, um, step away from your computer, your screen or your workstation, really try to designate your work area and your rest area and step away for a moment and just kind of disconnect. I'd also like to um, jump in here and speak a little um, for this question. So I think you can kind of look at this in a couple ways. Uh, the first being if you are part of an organization that is really positive towards mental health, um, incorporates, um, you know, pillars of trauma informed care in the workplace and it, mental health is seen as something um, to really be uh, fostered with an employee base, then I think the the whole like community aspect is, is an amazing thing that you can do is coming together as a team and figuring out something that works for everyone. Um, that can be great. But if you're part of a workplace that hasn't really caught up um, per se, then finding those moments, we've spoken about finding just, um, I think Dr. Sharma put it as sprinkling in the mindfulness. Um, and I love that. Uh, I love that. Uh, verb to sprinkle in because that's really what you're trying to do. So if you are part of a workplace that it's that's just not self care and uh, mental health isn't at the forefront of what they're doing, then look for those moments where you can take some mindfulness where you can gaze out the window and set your phone on a timer for one minute and focus on your breathing and just noticing the world around you and putting all those thoughts acknowledging them and then putting them to the side for that minute. Um, so finding those areas to sprinkle in a little bit of mindfulness can be really helpful there. Great. So I, um, I, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, we, we're missing a good opportunity here too, because um, I know that during the pandemic, we had the opportunity to um, work from home. And uh, we're, we're talking about having that environment of, um, you know, how are we going to take care of ourselves? And and one thing that's worked for me because I, I work it's hybrid. Uh, one thing that's definitely worked for me has been I still get up in the morning, I still iron my clothes, I still take a shower, I get myself ready to be in front of the camera, you know, do my work, and then I try to make sure that I find that time for you know I don't have a coworker telling me hey um, it's time for lunch. Um, it's just kind of finding that structure, um, and and it's important to find. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, the same time every day, but the more structured you are, the better it is to kind of give yourself that opportunity to learn to turn it on, turn it off. Because when you have your office in your home, it's, you know, one step away. So I, I picture it as, you know, it would take me about 45 minutes to an hour to drive to work. So then I want to make sure that I'm kind of easing my way into work and easing my way out of it. So just some helpful tips there. Great, thank you. That was actually one of the questions. Um, changing topics just a little bit, are there programs in the Tampa Bay area uh, directed at adolescents uh, to help them cope with anxiety? Yeah, I'd have to do some research. I really don't have it off the top of my head, but like I mentioned before, I would definitely try to um, reach out to your, your, you know, National Alliance of Mental Illness. Like they, each chapter is very uh, just full of resources. Um, and also, while we're talking about this, we haven't mentioned um, 988 and the crisis and um, and the um, 
the crisis and suicide line, uh, they have the chat option. So sometimes that really helps kind of be able to put things down on a keyboard where it isn't that expression of I'm calling you reaching out that way, but it's a little bit more feasible. So there is um, that option and then they can op open up more resources for you. Um, I don't want to talk for Crisis Center because you guys have a plethora of resource, but yeah. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Yeah, so um, my my response to this is personally, I am not aware of too many within the area, but um, my role at the crisis center is really about the training aspect. So um, call 211, call 211 and talk to our um, specialists who are on the phone. Um, they have such great resources and they know the background of programs. And they, I mean, I don't know how they even remember half the things they do. Um, but besides that, if you go to our website, crisiscenter.com, and you're going through the menus and you get to the Gateway Contact Center, at the bottom is another link to 211 at your fingertips. And that is basically our community resource guide, but virtual. Um, so you can go through and kind of filter options and look for specific things. Um, and I'll bring up a map and um, that'll be kind of a jumping off point. But when in doubt, you can always call 211. Um, in uh, not, it's not really a uh, local resource, but there is the teen helpline. Um, so they are, um, I believe it's a peer program where it's teens listening and they help provide support and resources to other teens that call in. They have a call, email, and text feature, I believe. Um, I'm not sure of, of the number, but again, it's, it's team line or teen line. I was also going to say, you know, calling Let's Talk is a great way to, you know, have a conversation with someone who can help you figure out what resources are out there. Um, and, and NAMI, I, I just want to say again, NAMI is a great resource um, for peer led groups. And there's a question that I see about, you know, where to find support groups. And I, and I just cannot say enough great things about the NAMI programs. Um, they are so normalizing because it is peers that you're talking to. Um, and same thing for your kids. My daughter, who I mentioned is a high schooler now about to, to graduate, um, was involved in a NAMI youth group, which during the pandemic, which was so wonderful for her to have that connection point of other young people who were going through this unprecedented time together. So we remind us again, Carrie, where to find that. Um, is that on your website? Not NAMI. Or yet, yeah, and now it's, it, I think it's um, type. Look for there's there's one in Hillsborough, one in Pinellas. If you if you type into a search, nami.org, that's the national, and you can get to a local affiliate. Or you can call Let's Talk, which is the um, eight four four U OK, or Let's Talk Tampa Bay. Dot org, or or go directly to Nami. They're just um, a wonderful organization. Thank you. And I'm glad you brought that up. That was the last thing I wanted um, to make sure that we got time to talk about. I think that'll be the last question for today. But, um, you know, we talk about self-care a lot of times as something that I do for myself by by myself. What are ways that we can incorporate self-care as kind of a communal practice? What are um, some other support um, groups or systems um, like you were talking about, Carrie, that um, can help us remember that we're not alone and that we don't have to come up with all the things by ourselves, um, but that we can be part of a community? I hope it, you don't mind that I'm going to talk again and then I'll mute um, again. I will say, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of quieter self-care practices today, but I will say a very purposeful self-care practice for me is, I call them joy practices. And so there are things that really just take my brain and shift this energy and they can be anything like, you know, honestly, like I, a sewing class for me, like learning how to sew was one thing that I was like, I'm going to find a group of people who are interested in learning something together. So your self-care external environment can look very different too, to the point that everyone is, is different, but don't, don't forget that joy, joy, laughter is, is a wonderful, purposeful thing to add into your, your, your toolkit um, that can truly reset your brain. I participate in laughter therapy and do that for a few patients. It's not for everyone, but there are a couple that I'm thinking um, right now that really enjoy it. And so at the end of our visit, we spend the last minute just laughing. Sometimes we'll, you know, 
start it with a joke and other times we'll just kind of laugh at laughter therapy. Um, lots of research to support its release in serotonin and your feel good hormones. Um, I'd like to just make a comment a little bit about food and nutrition. There's a lot of, you know, we truly are what we eat and food can truly be our medicine. And there's a lot of things in our, in our diet, if we incorporate that can help um, increase serotonin levels, which are feel good hormones. And so things like healthy carbohydrates can help reduce anxiety by increasing these hormones. And these are things like apples, pears, berries, your whole grains, vegetables. Um, if you do eat fish, then, you know, two servings of good quality fish get give you a nice amount of omega-3 fatty acids, which is really good for mood enhancing. Um, we live in a society where everyone's deficient in vitamin D, despite us living in, you know, the sunshine state. We are all really deficient in vitamin D. And so getting a little bit of sun exposure or honestly simply taking a vitamin D supplement, obviously talk to your provider to get dosage and quality of um, which one, but a vitamin D supplement personally has been so helpful in uplifting mood and in energy. Um, and so really take a look at your you know diet, obviously stay away from processed foods and refined foods. And unfortunately our, our food industry is in a little bit of a mess, but we have a lot of additives and preservatives and colors and dyes in a lot of our foods. And um, research is showing that these are some of the culprits or some of the reasons why we're seeing a little bit increased of ADHD and AD, ADD in our adolescent and children. So we, um, you know, just keep being mindful about your food and what you put in your body and I'm a big plant-based advocate and using food as a help to help alleviate your mood and to help enhance your mood can be helpful. Um, you know, watching your caffeine intake, if you have anxiety, things like that. So just wanted to make a comment on eating a nutritious whole food, you know, plant focused diet. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Um, we're grateful to the panelists and to those of you who joined. I think we got to all of the questions, but if I missed one, I am so sorry. Um, but thank you for joining, and we hope that you all will continue to develop great self tool, uh, great self care um, tools, and um, to just keep increasing the size of your toolbox so that you can be taking care of yourselves, uh, so that you can continue to contribute to the community around you. Thank you all again so much.